Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast series is brought to you by Morningstar, offering you technology and services to support your end-to-end financial advice process, including product research, investment data, and comprehensive financial planning technology through AdvisorLogic. AdvisorLogic offers you simple yet powerful tools to run your business, deliver holistic advice, and build trust with clients. You can experience an industry-leading digital advice offering. Simply select pre-built strategies, prepare products, and generate your advice documents within a single guided workflow. Welcome back to this episode in our technology innovation series brought to you by Morningstar. In this episode, we are covering off on expectations versus reality. Welcome back, Phil Thompson. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me. Fantastic to have you here. Now, let, uh, in this episode, we are talking, of course, about efficiencies, but we're talking a lot around the the ideas of you know, the reality of software. And sometimes we have these really amazing expectations of what software is going to do. Uh, and sometimes our uh, expectations are not met. Let's put yeah. it that way. Yeah. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about, uh, talk to me about some of the software that you've, you, you've chosen and, and, and how hard it is sometimes to, um, to have an expectation and then try and get that expectation or that software working the way you want it to work. Yeah, so for me, the way I think about the software that we use is like, what what's its core purpose? And like, um, if it's if it does its core purpose, then then great. Um, and does it help allow us to use another software that that does the ancillary benefits? Um, so I mean, our core software is a non financial planning software where we run a lot of our business, a lot of our emails, a lot of our task management. Um, and so its core purpose is to manage. Um, team tasks to help us understand what's going on with any one client within the team um, and to really track where clients are up to at any at any one stage. Um, and so that's really its core purpose. So um, it does that. It does that to a certain level where at a point where I'm looking at, you know, scrapping it all and moving somewhere else if, if that works and, and kind of did a lot of research on that and decided actually, you know what, no other software is perfect either. Yeah, so as long as it does its core purpose and allows us to do other things with other software, um, then that's kind of the highest priority um, for me. When you say solving a problem, obviously, um, you know, uh, or core, core purpose, I'm thinking of solving a problem. Um, and it's all around, I guess, I guess that what you're saying there is you want to really define what the problem is you're trying to solve uh, mm. to, before you start worrying about uh, judging the software or looking at the expectations. That's right. Yeah. For, so for me, it was a matter of how do we, um, being insurance only, we've got a very clear process of clients move from one step to the next step. You know, we get their fact find, then we prepare the strategy. We get the strategy, we then present the SOA and then all the way up into policy in place and then reviewing, um, ongoing. Um, and so it's a very, um, linear process, um, with, with what we're doing. So we, our, software that we needed was was able to help us with that linear process so there wasn't too many forks in the row now if if i was a full financial planning business i would have a software with that allowed me to fork off from our our you know our linear process so that's why we chose a software that was very much like a sales based software because it's you start here you move here you move here and then you end here um and so that um helped us with that now the downside of that is our ongoing reviews it's a little bit you know putting a square peg in a round hole with our current software um and so it's a matter of you know for us it's like well you know again what's our core process and can we use this software to to allow us to do that and i think we can but it's just a matter of maybe having you know the software do something that it's not really fit for purpose Um, but as long as it helps us do our core you know our core process of tracking where everyone is at at any point in time um, and helping our team communicate with that client, then that's really what the problem was that I needed. Yep. Now, now one of the things I think about when it comes to any software is, is the amount of soft, the, the amount of 
that you actually use, you know, to the full capability of, of the software itself. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, we sort of tend to, you know, have a package or a software and we only ever use a small part of it. How do you manage that? Yeah. So it's, I mean, the, the capabilities is also like with, with a lot of software companies, it's all tiered pricing. And so I was like, do we go the, the mega, the high end pricing to get all the capabilities? Or do we limit what we can do within this software and, and, and save a bit of coin? Um, so that's really what I think about is, you know, is yeah, just managing that tiered pricing or the way, the way that with our software it's set up. So we, we're pretty good at, at using a lot of the capabilities within, the, within our core software. And, you know, there's, there's features and benefits that we are yet to discover, but we, we kind of do, yeah, we're in it all day, every day. So we do use a lot of, a lot of the capabilities that our our core software allows. Yeah. Now, when you're researching software, there's obviously a lot of, um, you know, you tend to see all the bells and whistles pretty early on, and you tend to see all the good stuff about the software, and then and then mm. uh, and then later on, I guess when you implement them, that you you find a few of the things that might have been, you know, not not as happy with. And we also noticed that in a lot of uh, net promoter schools, when it comes to software, there's people who generally, um, you know, can be unhappy with the reality of or the you know versus the expectation. Yeah. Uh, how do you go with sort of, you know, implementing new software and, and that change management piece? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I just talk to lots of people. Um, so we were considering moving to Salesforce, um, actually, as, as one of the, um, a, you know, basically just throwing everything in the bin and starting again um, and taking all that we've learned and moving to Salesforce and just talking to lots of people. And, yeah, because it looks good on the surface, but then when you talk to people and you go, hey, does it do this thing that I'm missing? And they're like, oh, actually, no, it doesn't, as, as good as you're wanting. Um, so that's kind of the benefit of having a, a view in what, what we have, knowing what we currently have. And then if I'm researching other software providers, talking to people who use it and say, hey, does it do this? You know, because this is what the, the problem I'm having with our current or the limitation I'm having with our current software. Does this option provide that? If it does, great. Let's keep moving forward. If it doesn't, then, oh, well. There's a hard no on that software. Yeah. Okay. So the hard no is that part of the core the core purpose stuff? Do you actually make a list of that before you before you go out, or do you just start looking at stuff and then working out what your core purpose is later? Well, so this is this is looking at reviewing our existing software. So when when we when we moved to our current software, um, it was a it was a very basic list of what we needed. So it was, uh, you know, can it, can it help me track deals where we need to? Can it help me communicate? Like the whole team communicate and let's have visibility on, on that communication. So some really basic core features. And so our current software does that. But as we kind of really um, going deep into this software, there are some limitations. And then so it's a, then a matter of reviewing that software and going, okay, is this fit for purpose? And then going out, what, what don't we currently have? What do we want? And does this new software, you know, allow for that? Um, or do we just have a bolt on software with our, our current core, core provider? Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And we'll talk about some bolt on stuff in, in future episodes. Um, but it really does. I'm, uh, I, you know, I understand the idea of, you know, pushing up against limitations and every sort of software seems to have something that uh, doesn't quite work. And, and, you know, like I said earlier, there's not necessarily any, uh, silver bullet. Yeah. Exactly. Fantastic, Phil. Thanks for chatting to us in this episode. We look forward to catching you in the next episode where we start talking about uh, integrations. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Welcome back, Jody. Thank you for having me again, Fraser. Fantastic. Now, in this particular episode, we are discussing all things around the idea that uh, software can be amazing when it's working properly and, and we know how to use it and we're trained in it. But uh, sometimes our expectations for these things, uh, we're a little bit impatient, I guess, when it comes to what our expectations are versus the reality. We certainly are. And I think the key thing there was know how to use it and train in it. There are two things that as advisors, we don't want to set aside the time to do with technology. All the time we go, great, we've got this new tool, um, you know, Teams, for example, or Zoom. Let's just get in and use it. Um, however, we've skipped that important uh, process of actually watching the how-to video. Um, something that I actually didn't realise is Microsoft. If you Google Microsoft, there is a billion and one how-to videos on every part of Microsoft, whether it's Outlook, all of those sorts of things. Um, but quite often we just want to jump in and use it and we miss that important step of the training and the how-to, which can be 
can be frustrating. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because I think uh, I think once you know, I think we don't you always use software to its ability, uh, and that training is a is a huge piece of that jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, definitely. I think like when when we actually sit down and we do um, like training. Uh, seminars with Mike, obviously having an IT background every month, we'll focus on one of our tools and actually sit down and look at it. And all the time we're going, gosh, I didn't even know it could actually do that. So I think we only know maybe 30% of what the tool can actually do. Uh, Whereas when you actually drill deeper, there's already other solutions within it um, that we didn't know about. Yeah. So continuous training sounds like the uh, the key there. Is that that you do every month, did you say? Most definitely, yeah. So what we do within our team, we all take ownership of one of our softwares. So we've got 10, um, quite often we've got two each. And every month at our team meeting, um, we're all responsible for showing each other a new thing that our software can do. Uh, So we get to know that new thing. Um, And look, it can take five or 10 minutes just watching a help video um, and then being able to then show the team how to do those things is really important. Uh, we're always learning new things from the software that we use. Yeah, that's a really important part, isn't it? Divvying it up so that everybody comes along on the journey. It's not just one person's responsibility to 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 be the champion of the software. Definitely. Technology can be very overwhelming. And especially when you're using multiple apps and softwares, it's really hard to be an expert in all of them. So if you can be an expert in one or two of them and then share that knowledge across the team, uh, it's really helpful for everyone. Yeah, amazing. And what um, when when it comes to uh, I guess expectations versus reality, what what are you thinking of the measure of success for a software is um, when it comes to uh, you know the reality of what it has this software been successful? Yeah, so it needs to solve the problems. So what was the problem that we needed to solve by introducing it? If it creates more problems or doesn't solve that core problem, then is there any point to having it? So it all comes back to actually looking at um, what was the need for this tool in the first place? Has it solved that and has it added more to our, our practice or our business processes? If not, then it should be made redundant. Um, so yeah, and quite often, quite often, you know, you take on a new tool or a piece of software and you think it's going to be wonderful, it's going to be great, but it actually makes the process more onerous if you don't go yeah. through those those testing steps. It's interesting, isn't it, that frustration factor that comes in with, uh, it, and it may do that one thing that you wanted it to, but as you mentioned, if it's frustrating to use or slowing you down in other areas, then um, it's it's a decision time. Yeah, definitely. And it's so important also to embrace the technology, I think, too, because so often we can t- change is quite difficult and we still hold on to things that we were doing without embracing the tool to its uh, full capability. So you've got to, there's an element of letting go of the old to take on to the new. So when you do that, you need to make sure that you are actually embracing it to its full capacity as well uh, to make sure that you're getting getting everything from it that you need to. Fantastic. Uh, thanks, Jodie, for coming and chatting to us about that. I love the idea of um, getting your team in every every month to champion a different part of the software and, and uh, really rally around each other and teach each other the, the tricks and tips when it comes to uh, the new the new software. It is. Uh, fantastic. Jodie, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll catch you in the next episode. We're going to talk about integrations, and I'm keen to find out a little bit about your um, – about your technology stack or your 10 different uh, 10 different products that you use uh, we look forward to catching you then sure thing thank you welcome back mitch thank you very much for having me again fantastic now we're talking about uh, expectations uh, versus reality when it comes to software and uh, and implementing new softwares into your, into your business uh, tell us about uh, tell us about your uh, expectations when it comes to new software the way that we look at these things um they're, they're never really the panacea, right? Um, and I think that that's a really important point to start with. There's, it's never a silver bullet and there's a lot of marketing guff. Uh, you know, everybody does the same thing. Everybody's got to have a snappy headline. Every, everyone's got to have a, have a, good, uh, a good pitch and, and I understand that, but you, you really need to get into the guts of it and, um, and, and cut through that part and, and make an inform try to make an informed decision up front and then be really open uh, in engaging with the external stakeholders about uh, the same way that you do with with any partner or the same way advisors do i suppose with their clients you you give them an idea of what your business is and and, and how you operate you get an idea of 
what they're like and how they operate and you, you work out where the synergies are going to be and if it's actually a fit. Um, and as far as expectations are concerned, um, they're, they're, you're, we're really not looking in our business for anything that's going to overtake a human. We're really, as I alluded to in the previous episode, we're really looking for complementary pieces of technology. Um, so if you're if you're really clear about your expectations and what you're looking for, for from the technology up front, um, I think it, it's really it, it, it sets you up a lot better for the experience. Um, it's really important on that note to set really clear and realistic realistic expectations um, around what you expect it to deliver um, and what you're employing. And what we've really found that um, we've needed to temper, I suppose, our ex- our expectations and what what the success metrics look like, especially in the short term. And when we do that, they they do have the desired effect. Um, we we don't we really don't look for technology to be the silver bullet. We look for it to be an enabler running alongside. Yep, and and uh, that's a, that's a great way to walk into it. And I and I also noted that uh, in the last episode, you sort of mentioned the idea of engaging with the the product provider, uh, the software provider. Mm. Um, around what your precise uh, problems are that you have in that space that you want the software to solve. Yeah, so the product provider or third party too. So that, that, that actually raises a really good point. So um, in regards to solving some of the problems, the business that we're in at the moment in the growth phase that we're going through, not only now are we working through uh, a core business based in Australia with offshore support networks that we need to be able to effectively communicate and and workflow manage. Um, There's also um, a a geographical distribution onshore that that from a central point we need to be able to manage really well. Uh, And and something that most practices or or most businesses will have is a CRM or X plan or or, or something of that nature. And what we've done is is undergo uh, what has been pivotal, I suppose, in finding that successes that we have from an overarching management point of view and being able to, to have that centralised across that significantly distributed business that we now run. Um, and we can actually thank our licensee for that. Talk to me about the, the 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 concept when you do go into the problem, when you're trying to solve a, a specific problem. H- how do you define exactly what that problem is? And then how do you then take that to the provider and any provider and say, hey, um, you know, can can we solve this problem? And if so, you know, you know, what what what, are, what can be our expectations around solving it? Um, in a lot of circumstances, now it's um, it's something that smacks us between the eyes, and we have to we have to work pretty quickly to 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 change it. So, as far as having the problem solved, I don't. In some circumstances, really, mate, I don't think that they have the desired effect. In a lot of circumstances, they need further integration and development to be done. Um, and once we start to look to do some of those things, we see the uptick that we're looking for. It, it, it ha- has been um, a, a matter of building a relationship with that external provider, s- making sure that, that you're really conscious with the way that you outline your needs and requirements up front, but then creating that ongoing dialogue and making sure that in the initial engagement that you ha- that you set an expectation that they're there for ongoing support. Uh, because, you know, we're only a fledgling business we're doing what we can with what we've got. I say fledgling business because we're in, in respect to, to wading into technology um, and we're just doing what we can with what we've got and we don't really have any specialists in our business around that, so we quite heavily rely on them. So it's setting that expectation up front and making sure that the businesses that we're partnering with not only fit the bill as far as what the technology and the, and the capability of the technology is going to be to, able to provide us, but also the after sales support and the ability to have somebody on hand to continuously refine and integrate the, the technology um, into our business based on any dynamic change that we may see that, that's led by our business or by the industry that we're in, or potentially, and in a lot of circumstances, um, by virtue of the way that we're engaging them and, and, and the, the, the business that, that I'm talking to you about, just because we didn't know up front. So you're just constantly learning. Now, talk to me about the idea of um, how how long. Like, I mean, a lot, a lot of these times, these decisions are made, and um, you know, the reality is that software changes over time, and a better one comes along. Do you have any expectations around the 
the length of time product that might be using will stick around or how often you need to review it? A lot of the one, a lot of the different types of technology that we're wading into at the moment uh, are more often than not you're fairly heavily supported and long long standing for that exact reason. Um, we don't have the bandwidth to be able to so we like to. I would like to think that we're at the for, starting to get to the forefront of what we're doing in terms of the the use of technology, but we also hedge our bets to the extent that we use some of the larger, long-standing, more uh, ingrained businesses to ensure that there is that overlay that we're not going to be doing this project again uh, over the short term. That we're using using tested, tried and true. You know, we don't necessarily want to be the pioneers. Uh, we're, we're happy to happy to be a fast follower, but w- w- the the decision making process is normally around you know not the not the not jumping at shiny lights, but making sure that and just making sure that what we're what we're uh, leaning into is something that's going to stick around. You're exactly right. Brilliant. Thanks, Mitch, for coming on to this episode. We look forward to catching you in the next one. Thanks, mate. See you soon. Welcome back, Vicky. Welcome back to you, Fraser. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. We're talking about <laughs> expectations versus reality when it comes to technology. Now, I bet you see both sides of the story uh, running uh, teams of uh, ag- agile teams and people that are producing uh, producing the technology, I guess, as well as those uh, that you know want the what the outcomes and results. Uh, talk to us about you know expectations versus reality when it comes to uh, building technology. Yeah, so we have some amazing um, technology builders in Telstra, and I love the fact we have a lot of graduates as well with new and fresh ideas. And obviously, that comes with this huge um, I guess energy that you just don't want to um, you don't want to detract from that. Uh, yet, managing their expectations of what's achievable, particularly within a sprint cycle, as we mentioned before, which in Telstra is commonly a two-week block, uh, is probably a quite challenging as a coach. Um, quite often as soon as you start um, doing one of these prioritization techniques and taking out the fun things while the must-haves are built, uh, you can lose a lot of that energy. So we work really hard on making sure that those things stay on our um, agile boards, we call it. So say um, if it's visual, it's meaningful. So if it's up there, they still feel like there's a chance that they can work on it. So I don't want to take that chance away from them. Yep, and uh, and setting setting expectations with the the, the product owners or those people mm-hmm. that are going to be the end users. Uh, h- how do you go with that? Because often um, we know we're used to, especially with larger corporations, uh, we're used to getting some amazing software coming out. Um, we have an, a you know a great user experience, and then uh, the expectations all of a sudden go up um, and not aren't always easily met. That's correct. And I guess some of the techniques we might use are things like a bullseye diagram. That's a really great visual to try and put these concentric circles and quite a small circle deliberately in the middle, followed by the medium and the larger ring on the outside. And letting that product owner say there's only, you know, X amount that can fit in this this inner circle. The rest are all there. But as soon as you place something in there, the rest flow out is... um, one of the techniques that we use. And that real bullseye, I guess even that word means you are going to hit something. It, it may not be everything you, you're you expecting, um, but the reality is, is you will hit the bullseye if you uh, keep your capacity um, to what the team can manage. So yeah, we also sort do of, a lot of capacity planning in Agile. <laughs> it really, that's a that's a great diagram. I'm just thinking that as a, from a target point of view and, and, uh, and, and, and hitting the middle of the target, um, mm-hmm. you know, versus uh, versus hitting somewhere on the target. Yeah. Certainly, uh, exactly. certainly, yeah. certainly Keep great for, for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and as you say, the reality is you probably hit the target somewhere, not in, in the bullseye, not in the middle. Yeah, and, and some a uh, little bit more where it must, it's a must build. Uh, we might do something like an abstraction ladder. So we'll, we'll draw up a ladder, we'll put the problem statement sort of through the center and we continue ask those uh, five why questions and that heads you up the ladder. So why do you want that? Why do you need that? Why would you do that? Uh, and then the bottom of the ladder is the how. And it starts to let them see that to have that why, then the how. If you want that, how? How are we going to get it done? And um, they tend to stop on the ladder at some point where the uh, expectation is manageable. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting too. So run, run me through those questions again for the whys. Yeah, so five whys. So you just continue. Let's say the problem statement is uh, we need to build another mobile phone tower. Why? because the reception's not great in this part of the country. Why? Because we're, the current tower is too small, not high enough, et cetera. And I'm no technical expert. We, we run through those and eventually you end up with the, you know, something like the final why will be, so it's a pleasurable experience for all our customers in central Queensland. And then that's the focus. And then how do we give them a pleasurable experience? It may not have been the first idea you came up with. 
because the first idea was to build a mobile phone tower. The last yep. one was to give a pleasurable experience to our central Queensland customers and it may be achieved a different way. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, really good. Uh, now talk to me about the concept of um, you know, success measures and how do you go and put all those in place and then, and then work out you know, like with your sprints, for example, getting it done or getting it achieved, what's, a, what's successful, what's not successful? Yeah, we try to um, look at, I guess, maturity of where something got to. Um, so fail fast or succeed early is my preferred version of that. Um, when we get to the end of a sprint, we do uh, two particular ceremonies. So a sprint review reviews the actual work. So that's where we can discuss where we got to and why it's not the way we had said in our initial sprint. So that's all that technical discussion um, and perhaps how we could have got there better in a technical sense. So if you had delivered to me on the Tuesday, I could have rolled that out on Wednesday and maybe that would have made it all quicker. Uh, whereas the retrospective is about how we work together. So um, that's more, you know, if we got together uh, a couple more times or uh, if you'd shared those documents, um, you know, with me, the way we work together could have made it more successful. So we have a, the way we work technically and the way we worked emotionally together and the combination of both, we take into the next sprint those lessons and they go up as a card just like a piece of work. So if you and I agreed that we would meet uh, for two hours longer, um, mid sprint, that is a card on there that travels across just like we agreed to build widget X, Y, or Z. So we commit to the agile practices as much as we commit to the technical build. So uh, you have technical build cards, uh, and this mm. is for those people who haven't built software. You know, <laughs> think of it as a whole lot of post-it notes um, <laughs> on a wall, off the wall under the air a, conditioner. <laughs> yeah, uh, sitting on a wall, all moving along a, a process of stepping stones. Um, and so one of those cards is the idea of uh, you're adding emotional things to the cards. How do you feel about that? What was the process? Could we improve some personal Correct. stuff yeah, along because those cards? It's the way we work, not just what we're working on that makes a difference in Agile. Yeah, well, okay, great. So when it comes to, um, you know, uh, meeting people's expectations around software, there's probably a few cards you could add to that as well. Correct. Yeah. And I guess customer needs cards, we really want to have on there a lot of acceptance criteria will have a customer focus. So we want to build XYZ, but it's only acceptable to move it to done when we meet these emotional criteria from our customers. Yep. Now, uh, when it comes to short term versus long term thinking, I want to, I want to just quickly go through, because obviously there's a lot of decisions to be made in, in, in all corporations, large and small, uh, whether you are putting, you know, impl implementing software or or systems or processes for mm -hmm. the long term versus the short term and, mm -hmm. and how long, how long do, you know, things how change so long? fast, <laughs> things change so fast, it seems like that we, we, we introduce some technology and now before we know it, it's out of date. Mm. So in Agile at Scale, which is the, the top end, I guess, of the um, transformation in Telstra, uh, annual planning, so there's a big strategic plan that we try to do sort of T22, T25, that three-year marker. But annual planning and mid-term annual planning are those um, sort of longer-term pieces. Uh, Short-term, we have what's called the QBR, the quarterly business review. And that's an entire process in itself. And that's where we compete across the whole of Telstra for our resourcing and our time and whether our teams are formed the right way to work on Telstra's highest priority. So not just my mission team and what we were working on, but the whole of Telstra may need to rejig these agile teams to make sure we're servicing the greatest need for Telstra. So that's quarterly. Wow, so quarterly is sort of like your 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 benchmark milestone. Everything could change in, in next quarter. Correct. We try not to change a lot in a quarter, but we're really trying to be agile. Um, and so, if someone does call it out and it doesn't fit in those boxes, we certainly want to explore whether we could make that change mid sprint, mid cycle, mid annual plan, whatever is needed. Yep, and you can get uh, I don't know six two week sprints in, 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 into that period. So plenty <laughs> of work good. to be done. Uh, now, net promoter score is one of those things that's spoken about a lot when it comes to um, organisations. And obviously, to me, this sort of this comes back to the concept of reality versus perception. Often, yeah. if we've got low expectations, we can give something a really high net promoter score <laughs> because uh, it blew us away. But uh, often, when we're walking into technology and with the way we want it to use technology to, to solve issues, uh, we we have this high expectation of what it can do and therefore a net promoter score can often be low. Uh, how, how do you guys go? Do you have net promoter scores within, within internally? We do, or? yeah. It's a really um, important um, part of the Telstra way of uh, working uh, and it's not just our frontline uh, support staff who are selling the product out there who focus on net promoter score. It's all of us. 
um, including me as an Agile coach, uh, and how I can affect that. Um, so, and even in our team, so we'll have net promoter scores of whether one team serviced another internal team in Telstra. So we practice it all the way through. Uh, we have those detractors, which we don't want to see. So we're really keen on uh, spending some of our time working out uh, if someone's a detractor, could we, could we change that mindset? Because that's normally a mindset one. Uh, we have our advocates, which we love and we need to spend time embracing them to make sure they remain as an advocate. Uh, and probably the third one's that influencer. So they, they may be neither of the two above, but they're a really strong influencer, uh, either externally or internally. Uh, it's pretty important to know who they are when, you, when you're having a, um, any of these ceremonies that we conduct. Uh, and you need a couple of those influencers you need to showcase to them on a regular basis. So that's um, another Agile ceremony, probably monthly. We're trying to showcase um, with all three of those people in the room. So any detractors to see if we can help them understand uh, any of those advocates so that they'll go on and post and share all the amazing things. Uh, and those influencers, we really need to hit them up in that showcase for what we need from them to help us yep. be successful. Wonderful. Thank you, Vicky, for coming on and sharing. We look forward to catching you in the next episode. All right. Thanks for having me. Welcome back, Ivan Gower. Thanks, Fraser. Fantastic to have you here. We're talking about expectations versus reality. Uh, obviously, you've come from a, a background of uh, dealing with a lot of expectations when it comes to software uh, production. And I'm not just talking about expectations from, say, the advisor's point of view. There's, a, there's expectations from all different parts of, uh, of a business when it comes to producing software. Yeah, there definitely is. I mean, we we have diverse clients and when you look at a standard advice practice, you've got different people doing different things with the software. Um, you've obviously got your advisors, there's the support staff, the power planners, practice managers. Um, and then if you go broader into licensees, you've got your vetting and compliance and even your internal sort of centralised power planning teams. Um, I get to deal with internal staff as well who represent these people and uh, and they have a range of expectations and, and needs and wants as well. Yes, yeah, certainly, uh, certainly is. There's, there's, there's definitely many sides to this. Uh, talk to us about the um, the expectations that a lot of people have. I think I think we come from a world where technology is often feels like it's easy to produce or easy to um, to use. Uh, we we you know we're, we're very much used to large end of town technology spaces that things are just simple and easy, and and it kind of we get this expectation that anything that's rolled out should just be nice and simple. There's there's this view that technology is going to be the solution. And the reality is it can be a catalyst towards change. It should be considered an enabler, but in order to be the solution, it's it's got to come with quite a bit of work and quite a bit of commitment to, to learn it, to embrace it, um, and to leverage it. Yeah, that's certainly the key. And if, we, if we're talking about trying to make things efficient, then getting the most out of the software uh, comes with a, a fairly steep learning curve for all involved. There's always, I mean, it's it's a new piece of software, right? And uh, we've all experienced those changes over time. I remember when the ribbon was introduced to Microsoft Word and it just felt like a, a huge change. All of a sudden, you're trying to find where all your buttons are. Um, and that's using a piece of technology that um, you're already used to and already using. So changing technology and finding that um, you want to do the same thing, but there's a different way of doing it can can be quite disruptive. Um, learning how to use it most effectively and particularly focusing on the things you absolutely have to do. So what are the core outcomes of the business? Um, generally, things like we need to generate a statement of advice to present to this client. Um, that focus can help you just cut through all the features that are available um, and ensure that you're getting getting outcomes from the software, um, generating revenue from it as quickly as possible um, with time to then explore all these other features later on down the track. Yeah, it certainly does. And I'm, I'm thinking this is, a, as I mentioned, the the training aspect of it. How do you sort of go about that concept of, um, you know, we've, we created a new, a new something new, a new feature, uh, and then we really need to try and teach a whole lot of people uh, how to get the most out of it? That, that comes down to change management, I think, and the we'll, we'll spend a bit more time, I'm sure, talking about change management through the podcast, but the the key, I think, is understanding that it's you can't just drop training on people and expect them to pick it up. 
Um, you need to look at the different ways people learn. You know, sometimes people need to interact. Sometimes people need to explore. Sometimes they watch videos, attend webinars, read help material, or call a support desk. Um, there are different ways that people will pick up changes and you've kind of got to accommodate them all and appreciate that people sometimes need to hear it more than once. You know, I think when you're, when you're um, looking to roll out the change, you can fall into the trap of thinking, I know this, it's so easy, I've, I've, I've lived with it, I've, I've kind of brought about this change, so I really understand it, everyone else should understand it as well. But people need to, there's, there's that uh, research into the fact that in order to actually take on something, people need to hear it five times. Um, and, and you've really got to keep working with people, offer them training, offer them a different way of training, help them understand what the change is um, and help them understand how it relates to them. Yeah, I sort of feel like a lot of the time we have software and we don't necessarily get the full use of it or the full benefit of it. We sort of dabble around the outsides and use it a little bit. And we, I'm, we're all as guilty as others of it. I think, you know, all of the different parts of the moving softwares that we've gotten, stacks and those sorts of things, we tend not to use them all to their full extent. Which is a good thing. It's, it's, there's nothing to be ashamed of there. And I think what, uh, it take, the, take the Microsoft Word example again, the research that's gone into the general usage of Word says that 20% of the features in that system are frequently used. There's another 50% that are rarely used. And those features aren't used by the same people. They're picked up by one or two people here and there. Um, and that's a huge system. Financial planning systems are getting pretty big themselves. There's loads of features in there and lots of things that um, that only a few users are actually leveraging. I think the trick is not to try to use everything in the system, but try to use what you need to use. Um, be open to what else is there, but first and foremost, just use what you have to and what you can benefit from. And don't feel like you're not getting your money's worth if you're not using every single feature in there. Yep. Absolutely. And, uh, and I guess when it comes to the, some of these expectations around, you know, purchasing software, we sort of, I, I always like to think whether there's, it's a short term thinking type thing or a long term thinking type thing. Are we, are we making these decisions and our expectations around long term strategy or are they around just short term individual needs? The combination has got to be the best approach. If you can't do what you need to do on day one, then you will struggle to get value out of the software. But the long-term is key to to a long-term software relationship. And I, I don't think it's a productive approach to continually change your financial planning software. Um, I don't think anyone really expects when they change to be changing again in a year's time or something like that. You, you're looking at a five-year time frame to really embed it in your business and, and get the most out of it. Um, so understanding what's coming in the long term and understanding the company's track record of delivering is quite important. It gives you confidence in the fact that when they present a roadmap to you, they're going to be able to deliver on, on future functionality. Uh, and then, of course, agreeing on where that roadmap's going and feeling like you've got a voice in there and uh, and that it's consistent with your own business strategy. Yep. Now we've seen, uh, we uh, you often hear, um, you know, I guess some of the pains when it comes to people not being happy with software. Uh, that's probably an easy thing to, to vent on. There's net promoter scores come out um, a, a lot uh, and, you know, the idea is that it might be nice and new and shiny, but then when the net promoter scores are, are, are requested, um, that seems to be, uh, not a lot of really high net promoter scores as in a lot of advocates for, you know, the software. Is that, do you have a thoughts on that or why that might be? I will be interested in what, what the other participants in this series say about that. I, I'm always interested in hearing advisors' views on, you know, whether they promote a particular piece of software, particularly the one that I'm working with, um, and also how they go about that process because it's such an individual decision. You know, you'll talk to people who will say, I will never give anyone five stars. Four, four out of five is a really good score for me. Um, and you'll talk to others who will, you know, base their, their score on how they're going today or how they're going over the last three months or the last 12 months or or a lifetime. And what I get out of net promoter scores 
aside from the opportunity to have like an individual conversation and really drill into it, is the relative score from one period to the next. You know, I I would love net promoter scores in the, you know, t- in cr- approaching 100 uh, in the positive sense. But when we look at, you know, how did we rate last time versus how did we rate this time? I feel you can kind of normalise everyone's different views around how they rank and how they score and what influences that score. And you get that trend. Are we improving? Are the things that we're doing really having a positive impact on our client base? And, um, you know, like compounding interest, if you're continually improving, then over time you're going to um, be putting people in a, in a really nice position where they're getting value. Brilliant. Thank you, Ivan. Thanks for coming on this episode and we look forward to catching you in the next one. Thanks, Fraser.